This is the Naughty Animism channel and here's a video about the beings often understood as the adversaries of the harmonious existence and thereby the gods. And that are that is the, the giants, trolls uh, in Old Norse called Jötnar or Thursar. Um, the Jötnar or giants, trolls are, is actually a difficult topic I think and uh, I've had many requests about it from followers and supporters and uh, I also state that there's likely scholarship on this topic that I'm not familiar with. So perhaps in the spirit of those beings, uh, this is probably a little bit of a crazy reflection that travels between indigenous scholarship and the American election and Norse cosmology and, um, and so on. It's a train of free thought that seeks to, it seeks something comparable to what the Aboriginal scholar Titan Junker Porter Porter in his um, recent book Sand Talk calls indigenous pattern thinking, uh, and uh, which is like looking to traditional knowledge for patterns of creation that can be applied as a way of understanding the world around us. Right. Uh, uh, in this case, it's the relation to trolls and Jotnar giants as a pattern of creation that we can perhaps use to analyze the breathtaking situation as I'm making this video where the world holds its breath while arguably the most important nation in the world, the United States, is in the process of battling its big troll, right? Because if there's one word that is sadly accurate and sadly defining for our age, I think it's the word troll, which someone in a moment of truly inspired animist insight um, applied to this incoherent screaming and shouting without any logic and without any listening that is so characteristic of the internet, the troll heim, you might say, of our age. Uh, the word troll in contemporary English is borrowed from the medieval Viking invaders and it's derived from Old Norse uh, troll, an identical word, meaning some sort of dangerous um, other than social being of sorts. And uh, this, the troll is probably closely related to the Jötun or Jötnar, uh, which in English is often translated into giants. Uh, but somebody better schooled in, in the linguistics of this whole thing might be able to clarify the exact uh, semantics of these words, uh, both in English and in, in Old Norse. Uh, in this video, however, I will talk about these beings somewhat interchangeably. Troll and Jotnar as, as, as general representatives of this Nordic idea of the chaos sphere or the outside, the, uh, the social, uh, outside the social space, uh, where we find beings such as yeah, the Thursar, Rim Thursar, Jotnar, the Mythgard serpent, the Fenris wolf, and, and, and so on. All these beings that are forces beyond the human social sphere and therefore a potential threat to harmonious social existence, but, but they aren't just this threat. And that's, I think, really, really important. Uh, these beings are intimately engaged in the ordered harmonious sphere also while being outside it and potentially disruptive to it. Um, and they, they might uh, be dangerous, but they aren't evil in our sense. They, they might be dangerous, they can compromise or even destroy a human existence or a human social space. Um, but harmonious human community space also rests on relating, relation to these beings. You know, and, and we can see this if we look at mythology, where we see that this relation, the gods and, and, and uh, between the gods and the tro trolls, gods as guardians of the ordered uh, uh, community social space, and that this relating can take a lot of different forms. There's uh, relations of, of marriage, sexual relations, descent, the gods sometimes descent from the trolls or the Jotnar. They visit each other, their relations of guesthood, like in Chech, uh, in um, uh, exchange of knowledge. There's uh, making deals, trade, games, play, 
control, the biting the troll is really important, the Fenrir is bound, you know, uh, all kinds of social contracts, employment, servitude, adoption, judiciary, legal interaction, large scale fighting and violence, and enmity, but also more controlled, dueling like violence. And sometimes they're living together. Loki is a Jotun, a giant that lives with the gods. Perhaps Loki is, in a sense, the iconic Jotun, but according to Snorri, he's regarded as one of the Aesir. This is a Jotun figure which is identified almost with the Aesir, right? And uh, there, are, there are actually other cases of this where, where when you look at it in a story, and it seems that the gods and the trolls are almost aspects of the same closely related beings. Uh, a number of the gods are basically Jotnar. You have Skadi uh, and uh, Tyr, who, uh, who I'll return to uh, uh, later. And I, I'm not going to go through all these examples, just remark that the harmonious world springs from a controlling contract with the uh, Jotnar. And therefore, the Jotnar are actually uh, creative forces. They play a role in creation this, uh, itself. You know, Creation actually springs from a Jotun, a giant, Ymir, who's being killed and then his body is being, being uh, built into the, into the world. But there are also um, cases where this is much more like a social bound with the Jotun in all the complexity, in, with all these complexities that I think qualifies uh, as a, a pattern of creation. Like uh, Loki, who's often part of inciting something that ends up structuring the world, actually, building the world. Or Gevjun, who, uh, the goddess who begets four giant Jotun sons with a giant, a re quite remarkable sexual proverb for a godhead of virginity, and then she turns them into these sort of troll oxen and creates, creates Denmark by plowing the island Sealand out of the, 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 the landmass of Sweden. Uh, and these are forces of creation, and I believe that, 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 that you see this graphically uh, rendered in these uh, wonderful Swedish rune stones, whereby uh, many are Christian, and they, they show Christian crosses actually sort of emerging from, but also bound to a dragon which is encircling the ordered harmonious world. In some cases, it's actually an Yggdrasil figure. And I see this bond between the, the outside social, the other than social, and the social as a pattern of creation. Um, my favorite uh, image of the Yggdrasil is definitely the Ockelbo stone that I've, I've spoken about in, in other videos and, and sh showed uh, images of. Um, another image of this social bond is marriage. The two male Vanir gods, they marry Jotun uh, women. Uh, Njordr marries Skadi and Freyr mar marries uh, Gerdr. Sorry for my Icelandic pronunciation here. And uh, the, uh, this social contract can also be uh, servitude. Uh, the, the Jotnar, Fenja and Menja are servants, or slaves, of King Frodi, and they grind the wealth of his kingdom on their magic millstone. But when he presses them too hard, when he becomes grease, greedy, then they turn on him and they invoke destruction on his kingdom. So the contract, the social contract, a bond with these sort of controlled giants is precarious. It can break, you know. And the relation between the gods guarding the harmonious existence and these wild and potentially destructive forces of creation is, I think, both complex and intimate. And importantly, it is not this absolute opposition that you find in uh, Christianity, where there's a bit of a total war almost between angels who are absolute good and uh, uh, demons who, of course, are uh, absolute evil. Uh, Christian angels and de demons, they generally don't identify with each other. They don't marry each other. They don't like trade and exchange knowledge and hire each other. And they certainly don't make babies with, with each other. You know? uh, try to imagine a story where the Christian God would hire Satan as a builder to construct a protective wall around the Garden of Eden. Right? The thought is really weird, almost preposterous right? Right? In, in the Abrahamic uh, worldview. Right, uh, and this shows how uh, how radical I think the difference is between these two perceptions of other, the Christian demons, they're other, and the Norse giants, the trolls, they're also other. But the relating to this other is very, very different. 
And then something really important happens in the Norse reality when this contract or bond system between the gods and the trolls breaks down. Because then the result is the Ragnarok, the collapse of harmonious existence. Uh, and this is a result of breaking the bond. Uh, and when, when you look at, at uh, stories like Fenya and Menya that I just uh, I mentioned, or even the aspect of deceit that goes into the binding of the Fenrir, uh, then we see that this rupture is actually a two-way street. It's not like only the fault of the trolls or the Jotnar who suddenly runs wild. The gods also have a uh, responsibility for maintaining or breaking this, this bond or relation. Um, and the breaking is, of course, iconized in the breaking of bonds. The wolf runs free. The Fenya and Menya turns against Frothi. Loki tears himself loose and steers the, the, the uh, ship Naglfar towards the uh, battle with the gods. It is almost as if the relation to other turns Christian. And then you get this full-on confrontation, the Judgment Day or the, the Ragnarok. And I think this, this alignment between particularly the Ragnarok myth and Christianity is really interesting because the scholars who have uh, suggested that this myth and, and the Verlospa, the poem where it's communicated, has emerged as a response to the consolidation of Christianity in northern Norway. And I think this, this Verlospa uh, poem might be a case of what is sometimes called Millen millenarism or millenarianism. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of religious cultural reaction that often emerges uh, when traditional societies are exposed to emergent domination and uh, ruptures of traditional life. It's very well known from, from uh, the history of colonialism. And uh, in this case, the cultural domination is Christianity that is consolidating as the powerful religion and some other uh, social changes that are characteristic from, from, from the period of the Voldespa, the, the Viking Age. And it actually blows my mind a little bit that there aren't scholars who have been thinking specifically in terms of millinerism with regards to the Voldespa, because I think it's really, really obvious once you've sort of had the thought. Um, and uh, maybe, of course, there are some scholars that I, I'm not really aware of. But the, this reaction to the rise of a new worldview, one where the relation is broken, where angels certainly do not make babies with demons. This reaction also shows mythological reflections on climate change, relating to the very real experiences that Scandinavians had had in the 6th century of the cataclysmic effect that climate change, the so-called Fimbul winter, had on human communities. So the Ragnarok myth the breakdown of the bonds that tie the gods and Jotnar uh, together is mythically related to the breakdown of environment in climate change. And this is very animist. Where when we break the relation with the living world, then uh, things get wild uh, and, and die and forces run wild that are beyond the, the, the harmonious existence and uh, those forces that could feed harmonious existence but suddenly becomes a threat to it. All of a sudden the sea will devour the lands because the sea rises and the, or the myth gut serpent comes up from the sea and so on. Now what can we use this traditional knowledge perspective for when we look at the sad state of the world today? And this is just a kind of an, an, an experiment uh, a little bit with, with looking at this traditional knowledge perspective, bringing it into contemporary politics. Because obviously the bonds are broken. The trolls are loose. Sort the, the fire giant is scorching the earth with his flaming sword. And the, these trolls and Jotnar are, in a sense, those forces and humans that drive this destruction. For instance, the, the unbridled capitalism. You know, note how capitalism has been uh, the foundation of our society, but it also used to be under a higher level of, of state control. It's been breaking out you know, of, of, uh, of control. And of course, you can challenge the moral of capitalism like you could challenge the moral of, I don't know, a deity, Odin or Frey or something. Uh, but it has been the foundation of our life. And even if you are as socialist as me, you, you can also can't deny that Capitalism has produced a middle class that has become very rich, 
you know, a Danish student on contemporary state student support lives a life of luxury that in the past probably not even nobles could aspire to in terms of resource availability, healthcare, and, and, and so on. But this force has run loose, and that you can't deny that this force has now run loose and is devouring the world. The wolf is eating the sun and the moon, and the Ragnarok is in the process of manifesting. And, and part of the reason is, I think, this troll I'm here, the internet, which is colonizing the rest of reality. This Trollheim, the internet, it breeds these parallel realities through the way that information bubbles uh, and are producing these explosively expanding conspiracy theories and uh, misinformation and, and this very trollish, uh, trollish aspects to this. The, um, the MIT recently came with a study that showed that, that misinformation on the internet travels six times far, faster than actual in information. It's like the internet, the information source, is actually destroying information, right? And, and uh, this, it, it does something to our attention and our capacity to think. Because uh, through social media uh, particularly, what happens is that our attention span is being completely disrupted. We lose the capacity to uh, hold in our mind larger complexes of meaning and, and, uh, and, and think with larger complexes of meaning. Uh, because in order for these, uh, these companies to keep our attention, they have to hyper-stimulate our attention all the time. And this hyper-stimulation of our attention uh, means that we are con continuously uh, attention overstimulated. Probably most of the people who are watching this video didn't reach as this far as I'm taking, as, I, as where I am now, because people quite simply do not have the attention span to listen to something for more than 20 minutes. Um, and, uh, and, and this is very trollish, this breakdown of, uh, of attention, uh, attention span. This is also why contemporary politics uh, goes from being people debating each other, actually talking to each other and figuring out how to run a social system to this kind of conflictual screaming all the time, like, lock her up, lock her up. It's like, when stuff is conflictual, then it grabs attention very uh, powerfully. Um, so, uh, and it's why you, we have these politicians today that, that you know, they, they, they contradict themselves from one sentence to, to the next. Uh, Donald Trump is the main example of this. He's so inconsistent. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the troll kind of non other than social uh, dynamisms that are sort of uh, attacking our social space, really. And uh, I think this this expanding uh, trollheim is is also directly detrimental to uh, another part of our normal world uh, order, and that's democracy which rests on, 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 on a certain level of being able to debate meaningful with each other you know, and, and human decency. It's not just the screaming, lock her up, lock her up, you know. And as I'm making this, uh, Joe Biden uh, looks like he's winning the American election. And uh, we've just seen, uh, you know, for the last four years, what is in fact an internet troll crawling out of the trollheim and ruling for four years, deteriorating the entire international uh, sort of dialogue to this four-year-old level uh, and actually attacking also the, the, the bonds, the social contracts of democracy. And this is the trolls breaking the bonds of our normal social contract, whatever you might think of this social contract, with all its drawbacks and so on. And it's a force that is beyond the social bond who tries to break it. Like Donald Trump is iconically trollish. He doesn't just physically look like an actual troll, uh, uh, but if you, if you listen to how he speaks, then he contradicts himself so much, and that is this kind of Trollheim logic. And he actually disrupts harmonious uh, coexistence at every single turn, because conflictuality is much more attention-grabbing than actually coherence, which takes a little bit more uh, attention, right? It's a very, very troll behavior. This whole thing about a uh, boisterous match opposing being much more important than the consistency of what meaning of what you're saying. So if you look at the names of Jotnar, Thursar, Norse lore, then the meaning of these names, many of these names, they have meanings that associate somehow with noise or meaningless uh, sound, actually. 
And um, this is a politics where we used to debate with each other and figure out how to run a, a social system has deteriorated completely into this noise making kind of grunting, I'm good, I'm big, you know, they bad, I'm good, they big, all the time, you know. And uh, it's so trollish. It's the yacht now, it's the giants, they're out of control because the social bond with them somehow has, has broken down. So the Trollheim here on the internet is in a sense uh, attacking Mythgard, I think. And this is of course the a ra a sign of the Ragnarok, breakdown, a complete breakdown. Trollheim seem to have almost subdued the United States. As I'm, as I'm making this now, we basically don't know if Trollheim will conquer the USA uh, and uh, rule for four years more. And of course, uh, we have exactly the same kinds of politicians in Europe. It's not about Europeans kind of posing as better than Americans, uh, but uh, it's just as if it, if it happened with this incredible speed and intensity in, in, in America. And I want to stay with the American example a little bit because I think it's really, really telling. Uh, and uh, yeah, there was a, a Cuban Santeria priest who uh, once told me that the patron deity of the uh, the USA is the god Ogun, the Oricha of war, but also of civilization, progress, and industry. And I really buy that. You know, the, the USA is iconic of this industrious and also very war minded, actually, country. Uh, I suggest reading an article by the uh, Canadian anthropologist Wade Davis, who describes the United States as this. This country of extremes, this country that can perform miracles when its people set themselves to it. You know, he spoke about how the U.S. had operated through the, the Second World War, where one single Chrysler factory, you know, produced more tanks than the entire Hitler Germany, right? And uh, where uh, the Americans invented synthetic rubber production from scratch because the uh, Japanese had conquered part of the world where rubber production primarily took place, organic rubber, right? Uh, this enormous uh, capacity, potency to make shit happen, basically. Now, from the Risha perspective, it's very, all very, very Ugun. Now, in the Nordic mythology, it will make sense to equate or compare Ugun with the god Tyr, who's also a war god. Like Ogun is a controlling force towards the Loki, like Jotun force, the trickster Eshu in the uh, Orisha religion, then Tyr is also the one that controls and binds the Fenris wolf. And in the binding, he loses his hand. And this missing hand is actually important. Uh, there's something about missing body parts in Nordic myth, as my uh, friend Ross Downing has pointed out, and perhaps other scholars. Uh, in Nordic myth, there's this thing that the missing body part actually represents the positive quality of, of a figure. Like the seer Odin, he misses an eye. The talker Loki, he has torn lips. So the one that holds control, the chaotic Jotnar, uh, he misses a hand. That hand that holds the wolf is the hand that he paid to be able to bind the wolf, create the bond. But Tyr is, is also uh, related actually to the Jotnar, to the giant himself. According to the Hemiskvidar, he's the son of Hemir, a giant. Uh, and like, by the way, uh, the Oricha uh, Ogun is the brother of the trickster uh, Eshu. Um, so Tyr is also a deity that is associated with the, the thing, the parliament. He sacralizes that place and thereby he's a patron uh, of that part of the social order, order that is specifically associated with the people, we might say. Um, now, the concept of, of democracy, of course, of course, didn't exist at all in the Middle Ages. But today, I think it would make sense to see Tyr as a patron of democracy uh, because that is what the, the, the thing is today. Indeed, Scandinavians still use that word, thing, to uh, represent their uh, democratic, uh, democratic parliaments. Denmark has Folketinget, uh, Norway has Stortinget, uh, Iceland has uh, the Althingi, uh, which some consider, in fact, to be the, the oldest democratic institution on the planet. Um, now, of course, Donald Trump then represents an attack on the root of democracy. He asks voters to vote twice. An American president asking voters to 
cheat. He, he doesn't cede power when he loses. He trolls. He's trolling these doubts about the democratic process itself. He attacks them directly. He tries to disrupt the counting. And all these are clearly you know, radical breaks on the fundamental social contract of the thing, the law that binds democracy uh, together. Uh, and importantly, he does this with trolley's behavior. Uh, the spreading of these parallel reality and conspiracy nonsense and so on, this constant noising about the whole thing. And like, I mean, for instance, the whole thing about saying it's only legitimate if I win. It's so, like, iconically four-year-old behavior. It's very, very trollish. The sort of kind of wild absence of sort of adult uh, behavior, basically. And it's much, much more trollish, I think, in fact, than what we know from the 20th century fascists, who were like, they were probably like order fascists, right? Um, but, uh, but what is manifesting in him is, in a sense, the wolf running free, the breakdown of social contact. Contract, I think, is really, really evident in, 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 in the, 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 this thing about attacking the very foundation, the bonds, the contract that underlie exactly the social order, democracy. And in a sense, you could call it defilements of perhaps the sanctity of those institutions. And thereby, you know, if you follow the train of, of thinking and attack on America's essence, his patron deity, Tyr Ogun. Right? Uh, and, but though I'm really judgmental about Donald Trump, and I don't mince my words, I just say what I think, you know, um, I think it's, it's also interesting to look at what this traditional knowledge perspective uh, on contemporary politics actually would teach us on the left wing, right? And, and I think it might show us that, uh, well, there might be war and Ragnarok in the immediate uh, horizon. Um, certainly is an environmental uh, Ragnarok unfolding that we need to fight. You know? um, but it also really implies, I think, that avoiding the Ragnarok is trying to mend the broken bonds with the trolls. If we keep alienating the trolls, then it is that they go really bad. It is when the Frothy breaks his bond, his social bond with Fenya and Menya, that they turn on him. And I think the message uh, in there uh, uh, is, yeah, to recreate the bond somehow. And this is not necessarily something that I myself really know how to practice. I mean, how, <coughs> how does one establish respect for the you know, infantile insanity of Donald Trump? I really don't know. I, I don't know. And I've been running my own total little cancel culture regime here on my platform. You know, if people say racist stuff, for instance, or stuff that exceed a certain level of aggressive idiocy on my platform, I just run block, ban, delete on them, you know? And uh, I've learned that engaging trolls on their terms is absolutely a lost cause, uh, because there's only one way of engaging them on, the, uh, on that field, and that is trolling back. And when you troll, of course, uh, you're not create, actually creating a social bond with those trolls. You're just letting them uh, expand even more, spread even more uh, by producing polarization. And I totally think that the left wing has been infected with a lot of the, the uh, trolling behavior that is really so characteristic of the alt-right, right? The, the, uh, you see people noising in the same way. The, the, you see these... Um, uh, crazy uh, inconsistencies, hardcore just mentalism, ethnocentrism, even juvenism, perhaps not in exactly the same extent and with the same implied violence, for instance, but uh, certainly comparable in structure to what you see from these like kind of outright incel people and stuff like that. And I think it's really, really toxic interface that I'm seeing between, for instance, like these 22-year-old undergraduates who you have zero clue about, for instance, discourse theory and subject positioning, but will give you a super patronizing lecture on your subject position. For instance, how your whiteness means that you're not allowed to say this or that. You know, even me saying this would probably make people go, oh, you're white and you're saying that and you're not allowed to say it. But, and, and, and you, cannot, you cannot enter into... In, enter into a debate with this position. You, you cannot, for instance, say, do you understand what subject positioning is? Do you understand how you're, you're universalizing and the consequences of that? You know, I think it's, it's producing a super toxic, toxic 
interface, this, this uh, trolling, non-listening, trollheim behavior uh, also on the left uh, wing, uh, where that produce totally polarizing uh, results. Uh, there was a Norwegian guy uh, who described this from the other side. He came back around to reality after I've been pushed into some incel radicalism and misogyny, hardcore stuff by leftist sort of eat Paul trolling that he'd been exposed to. Um, I'll put a link to this guy's uh, article in the, uh, in, in, in the link, uh, unfortunately, in Norwegian. And yeah, I have a quite detailed analysis, by the way, how I see this unbridled trolling behavior uh, developing the left wing and I think compromising the projects of the left wing, and I won't go into it further here. Uh, the left wing works from positions that I also come from, and they have kinder and more sympathetic political, less you know psychopathic projects. Uh, but sadly, uh, trolling behavior is, is also uh, kind of overtaking part of the left wing. The trollheim is expanding all, all, also here by these polarizations and these ruptured relations. And I don't have a solution to how to address this expanding Trollheim, you know? Because, you know, the level of drooling idiocy that you meet uh, all the time, how can you create relation to that? I really don't know. And, and, and this, I think, might be a general problem on the left, and I'm including myself here. Um, I mean, when I just pr press, for instance, you know, ban, block, delete uh, on anything that smells on racism on my platforms, I mean, in a sense, reproducing the, the, the opposition and, and creating uh, information bubble, perhaps even enforcing in unintended ways these idiotic positions that I dislike so much. But giving them platform is totally not an option. Like, it, it, you know, it, it's a bit like it's the least bad thing I can do, but still quite unsatisfactory. Because when you are uh, thinking with the Jotnar, and, and I actually think that the uh, fundamental call of this traditional knowledge is to re reforge relation and create social bonds somehow, engage the underlying dynamisms rather than reject. Um, and like for instance, I read, recently read an article uh, by a leftist uh, journalist who had infiltrated some white nationalist dating sites and she opposed as this like attractive gun toting blonde called like Ashlyn or something. Uh, and her description showed these really, really lonely guys who just longed with a deep, deep yearning for com companionship that they themselves selves realized was impossible. They, they, they knew that they were going to die lonely because, hey, I mean, what women want to be with militant white nationalist fruitcase, of course, right? And, and we, that's very understandable. These guys were also deeply unpleasant people, racists and whatnot. But it's so easy to say, it's so easy to just say, enemy, end of story. Uh, what struck me was that there was, I, I sort of, when I read it, I felt sorry for that, those guys, as he described, who were trapped in this deep sadness and existential lon loneliness that's so truly chilling to think about. But it didn't make sense, I didn't sense any kind of note of compassion towards these people in, 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 in the description, like, not really, you know. And I would ask from this traditional knowledge perspective, is this not a kind of Ragnarok Reaction, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. Uh, the reaction that poses this unambiguous confrontation, angels towards demons and absolute conflict, not Aesir and trolls who make babies and move in with one another and exchange in so many ways. Um, but when you see in our world people moving out of this Trollheim, where, where everybody's just screaming and shouting and feels like nobody listens and probably nobody came this far in this video, then even those that we think of as, as, as enemies, they can actually be reached. Uh, there's a number of amazing cases where, where people are doing, doing this. You know, suddenly you see, you know, here in Trollheim, you see a Black Lives Matter pro protester who spoke at a Trump rally. Um, and in fact, he was just standing there and reached out and he didn't flip these people out of their parallel realities, of course, but he did a really amazing job when you consider the level of polarization between these people. And he was just one guy speaking to a crowd of people for, I don't know, five minutes or something like that. I saw recordings of an Indian woman who just walked up to his racist parade and thinks he was a journalist or something. And she started uh, to get to know these probably lonely, sad men. She really managed to create a report Report. This was like white supremacists. There was a Danish politician 
of uh, Turkish descent called Özlem Sekic. She systematically went and visited people who sent her like really, really hateful uh, hate mail. There was a Muslim imam in England uh, uh, who in, in some documentary, he befriended a white nationalist and then they went through a process together. Um, and I don't know, I mean, people, people usually think about Nordic heritage as this super warrior-esque thing, but I actually think that these ways of engaging other, in this case, you know, the outright crazy other, are somehow deeper in alignment with this kind of traditional knowledge. And perhaps uh, that's also, uh, you know, warriorhood, if that is what you need, you know. Uslim Sekic, little dark woman who goes out to majority population and meet these you know, white dudes who wrote like really, really aggressive uh, emails to her. The balls on that woman. Uh, think about the, the, uh, the, that Indian journalist who just walked off to white supremacist rally, achieved amazing report of the Black Lives Matter pro protest who stood up and delivered his message to a Trump rally and really got heard. You know, it, I, if you need warriorhood, <laughs> I not need a lot of warriorhood, but if you need it, that's, I think that's warriorhood, you know? And I th think perhaps these are, this is some, some of what we need. These are, this is actually the heroic way of acting, not just the screaming and shouting about anti-racism from keyboard position that I'm totally part of doing, but the people who, and I'm not sure I can count myself among those who really actually go out there and in fact defy the spread of the Trollheim by personal in-flesh relation making. And this situation here, like where the great American troll is in fact attacking democracy and self, the thingstead that is guarded by Tia, the patron uh, deity of democracy and perhaps of the United States. You know, in this situation, I would recommend that we look to the thingstead, the real place in the real world, Middle Earth, dude, you know, where real people meet and talk and bond and create relation and figure shit out. Not this flipping Trollheim, Utgather uh, that, that we have here, where everything is noise and everybody's trolled and everybody's trolling and information bubbles producing by, by these big tech attention extraction uh, capitalism, you know. Um, and, and, and in this situation, I suggest calling on Tyr and on Ogun to reforce the bond uh, Tyr is the god of the thingstead, the real place where people are sitting and looking at each other in the eye on a circle of stones, you know. And in the myth, in this most sacred place, which is protected by an inalienable law against violence, Tyr reaches out his hand against a radical other and loses some of himself. And in doing that, he creates the bond that controls chaos and creates the conditions for harmonious existence. So I think that, that this is the hour to call on Tyr. I think that, that this is the God that might be able to, this is the force that might be able to bring us back a step from the precipice of this Ragnarok and perhaps reinstate a bit of this social harmony. Uh, you know, and This is not to say that everything was just social harmony and honky-dory walk on roses before Donald Trump. There was loads of problem, but this particular troll has brought the whole world into a particularly dangerous spot of destructive, very destructive levels of social polarization. And we need to refine the bond with the trolls, perhaps make babies with them somehow, so they don't devour us. And, and I don't mean making babies with Donald Trump, <laughs> who's only a, a, a symptom, uh, but the underlying dynamisms that this man is manifesting in this world. Uh, and this is how we need to forge some relation somehow, perhaps ask ourselves, what are the motivations and drives that make people religious fanatics, nationalists, misogynists, you know, do those dynamisms in, inside normal people who are probably, you know, kind and decent people, those fears, anxieties and passions. Uh, and I think the left has lost, lost uh, touch with that somehow. Perhaps uh, this is where we should connect and create relation the fear of globalization, which is real inside people. The fear of excessive control, the, uh, which is very real. The lack of basic education. You know, uh, people can't spell their own names. Insecurity, fear of the other being marginalized, not only because of race, gender, uh, sexuality, and so on, but also because of class, for instance. The, the uh, insane paradox at least in North America, that exactly the people whose life would be radically improved by a socialist system 
consistently imagine that a socialist system is some sort of evil Borg empire, right? Well, yeah, as you can hear, I'm just trying to speculate here. And, and, and I really think that actually this is important in recreating traditional knowledge to sort of have a little bit of this free, uh, free rantings almost. As you were a sentence, our traditional knowledge structures have been deeply ruptured. Um, and we don't have access to the kind of intimate wisdom of the patterns of creation that you see, for instance, in the Aboriginal scholar Tyson Yukaporta, who I mentioned in the beginning, who describes in his uh, recent and amazing book, Sand Talk, you meet these elders who can apply indigenous pattern thinking to understand any complex system like, you know, Aboriginal cosmology, use it to understand macroeconomic economics and make predictions on macroeconomic developments and so on. We don't have that, right? So searching for such a traditional pattern thinking becomes uh, really important. And I think that, that this thing about the trolls could be a really good example of how we can refine some really relational traditional culture that may perhaps help us in this dire mess that we're in, right? I hope that has all made sense and that you made it so far. If you're still with me, then I'll just note that, you know, press like and share and, you know, subscribe and the little ding ding that and in YouTube and write something and you can Patreon support me. My name is uh, Runyan Erasmus. I'm a historian of religion. I'm working with uh, reading Nordic religion as traditional uh, knowledge forms that have been rejected through the processes of Christianization and modernization. And... Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening and see you around.